Hello, everyone, and welcome to the release of the International Gas Union's 15th Annual uh, Global Wholesale Price Report produced by the IGU Strategy Committee, which issued its first survey in 2005. For those of you joining us for the first time, just a few words about the IGU. The IGU is a global gas industry association, we, unique, which uniquely represents the entire global gas value chain from production all the way through to end use in over 80 countries around the world. Our members are engaged in all aspects of the industry, including natural gas and new, new green gases like renewable natural gas and hydrogen, and jointly they represent over 90% of the global gas market. The IGU has 11 technical committees of industry professionals working on key industry issues and, or, and uh, organizes key global events every year. The next one uh, will be the International Gas Research Conference in Banff, Canada. This is a very important conference for us. This is an event focusing on the innovation and advancement of gas technology. And I invite you all to visit the website and to learn about the ongoing call for papers. The deadline for that is next week. And also to subscribe to news and updates so that you can be up to date with announcements of speakers and the opening of early registration, which is soon approaching. We're very fortunate today to have with us excellent uh, global experts in, in, in uh, global gas markets and price participating in the discussion. Uh, we will have with us Mike Fullwood, who is a senior uh, research fellow at the Oxford Institute of Energy Studies and the lead author of the report. Mike was uh, with the strategy committee of the IGU when it launched the report back in 2005. So we're very happy to have Mike with us uh, this year again. Vera Bly, she's the head of established benchmarks uh, at S&P Global Commodity Insights. Tom uh, marzic Manser, he's head of gas analytics at ICIS, and of course, Greg Molnar, uh, he is the gas analyst at the International Energy Agency. We will uh, soon play a short video message from the president of the IGU, Madam Lia Lan, followed by the re re report key findings presentation by Mike uh, before we get into the discussion. Now, I will ask all the members of the press to please prepare your questions uh, and submit them via the, the question and answer function only after the presentation. Uh, and also just before we launch uh, into the video, I will mention this disclaimer. We may make forward-looking statements during the presentation today. Please treat them with caution as being true as of today, and uh, we do not uh, make any guarantees about uh, future, future um, projections. So without further ado, uh, I will ask uh, now to play the video and uh, let's get started. Thank you very much. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. As the president of the IGU, I warmly welcome you all to the release conference of the IGU flagship report. First, about the report. The report is truly a unique database of the gas market information that has been tracking the incredible transformation and globalization of the gas market. The report is updated with data from the most turbulent year in the history of the industry and that continues to show the importance of a well-functioning global gas market. Second, about the last year, 2022 was a year that the global gas industry will remember. I highly two key words to describe our gas industry last year, high price and undersupply. The significant increased gas prices has had a huge impact on people's lives and economies in Europe and around the world. That had made us all acutely aware of the importance of stable prices for development and for the gas industry. The very high prices sadly left some developing countries of the world out of the gas market. The shortage of gas supply in the market also unfortunately had a negative impact on demand, 
forcing consumers to switch to more polluting alternatives, or in some cases, completely shut down. The last two years told us that supply needs should be developed ahead of demand because projects and infrastructure take time to build. Third, the role of natural gas. Although the gas industry has faced unprecedented challenges in the past year, is temporary. I'm confident in the development of the gas industry because the world needs more gas, not less. Natural gas is truly a global commodity. It's flexible, reliable, abundant, and low carbon. The LNG market greatly enhances the value of gas by making it accessible where it's needed. The well-functioning global liquid market makes it possible to adjust to the new condition with record speed. The gas industry is enhancing the richness of options and innovation on the technology and on the commercial side. In sum, the gas industry has a lot to offer. I also believe that the sound policy and the thoughtful planning will prevail and underscore gas is essential to re-establish the lost global security and to deliver an orderly energy transition. No other field like gas can provide the flexibility and the resilience while reducing emissions can balance the side of the energy trilemma. In conclusion, gas and renewables are two pillars of decarbonization and we will need both to succeed in the energy transition. I believe today's discussion is significant for our understanding of the past and for better informed discussion to shape the future. I hope you will find this presentation interesting. Thank you very much. And now we will go to Mike for the presentation of report's key findings. Okay, thank you very much, Tatiana, and welcome everybody. Um, I've got about 10, 10 minutes or so just to go through the findings of the report. Um, so we'll get to the next, thank you. Um, so the 2022 survey, which conducted this year, was the 15th we've done. Uh, began in 2005, or sort of the year 2005 was done after the Amsterdam uh, World Gas Conference in 2006. It's now done on an annual basis, so we have a long history of, um, of data to analyse. The server response is now covered about 91% of total world consumption. Um, response was a little bit down this year uh, following the Russian uh, war in Ukraine. Um, it's difficult to get some responses out of some former Soviet Union countries, but we managed to analyze some of that data. We do the analysis at the world level, the global trends in price formation, and then break it down to the regional level as well to look at what's happening in different regions. And we also used in the report uh, the data to analyze global gas price convergence since 2005. On that price, were converging, obviously, until, until uh, the last couple of years. Just very briefly, um, when we talk about the regions, this is the IGU regional definitions. Most of them seem to be, I think, fairly self-explanatory. Um, the key one, however, in the in Asia and Asia Pacific, the Asia region we refer to is China and largely South Asia, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and Myanmar. And the rest uh, is, is in the Asia Pacific, like Japan, Korea, Taiwan, um, and obviously Southeast Asian countries. So bear that in mind when we're going, going through the uh, regional analysis. Next slide, please. Yes, for those of you who are familiar with the survey, um, then we have a number of definitions of price formation at the wholesale level. Um, I'll refer mainly to OP, OPE, which is oil price escalation or oil indexation. There's gas on gas competition, which is the trading markets, hub pricing. And then all those beginning with R are the regulated forms of pricing. Uh, from cost of service down to subsidised pricing regulated below cost. Um, so basically between 2005-22, the, the, the GOG share nearly doubled from 31.5% to, to it's now reached over 50% with the oil indexation mechanism falling from 24% to 17.5%. 
most of the rise in the in GOD, GM decline in OPE uh, between 2005 and 2017 were largely driven by changes in Europe, in pipeline imports, uh, with OPE almost disappearing in northwest and central Europe, following the European energy market reform and liberalisation over that period. Since around 2016, um, then the, the, the continued switch to gas and gas competition has largely been a result of rising uh, GOG pricing share and energy imports, especially by spot market energy trade, which we'll go on to uh, in more detail in a minute. Um, up until 2016, there was also a switch away from regulated, so you go back a slide, please, or switch away from regulated pricing mechanisms uh, towards the more market based pricing mechanisms, such as GOG and OPE. Since then, that move has paused somewhat, uh, with the key changes being in the LNG market, as we said. Next slide, please. In terms of pipeline imports, uh, and that is any inter-country trade is, is deemed a pipeline import, GOG is now 63%, um, as, as we said, largely a result of the switches in Europe. It rose again in 2022. Uh, with some of Turkey's contracted pipeline imports from Russia switching to hub pricing, away from all indexation, and the pricing of pipe imports from Algeria into, into Tunisia also changed to gas on gas competition. So, the two main changes in 2022. So, next slide, please. Turning to LNG imports, um, the growth in the share of total gas on gas competition in LNG imports took off in 2017. Um, largely following the introduction into the market of US LNG exports. That's had a significant impact uh, since 2017. So that share nearly doubled between, between 2016 and 2022. It's 25% in 2016. It's now reached 47% of all LNG trade. GOG can be split into two different categories. One is spot LNG, um, GOG spot. The LNG sold into traded markets, such as the UK, Netherlands, all linked to hub prices in contracts, uh, as defined as GOG traded. Uh, and that includes obviously, obviously Henry Hub linked uh, LNG pricing. Next slide, please. I will dwell a little bit, uh, click on the next one as well to bring both up. Um, so between to click on the next one as well, please. Between 2016 and 2018, the rise was all due to rising spot LNG imports. While in 2019, the increase was partly spot LNG imports and partly significant rush of LNG to, Europe, to Europe's trading markets. In 2020, the increase was largely driven uh, by the rising spot LNG cargoes. 2021, Henry Hub priced uh, US LNG entered the market. The share of spot LNG defined as spot cargoes and less than one year contracts in the market in 2022. And this survey rose back again to 35% on a small decline in 2021. Prior to 2020, the growth of spot imports was predominantly in the Asia Pacific region uh, and the growth in Asia starting in 20, 2010 um, when China came more into the market. In Europe, the spot volume was relatively low until 2018, with the, the gas on gas LNG imports being mainly into the Northwest Europe markets. So from 2016, the rise was largely a consequence of the surge in US LNG exports. And since 2016, there's also been increasing volumes of spot LNG into the Asian markets of India and China and into Japan and South Korea. In Europe, spot LNG began growing strongly in 2019 as the rising LNG supply, the surplus, found a home there. Uh, in China, spot LNG reached almost 50 BCM in 2021. But this more than halved, a key final report in 2022 with flat China gas demand, and obviously the pull of Europe for spot cargoes. In 2022, spot volumes were around 64 BCM in Europe, almost 40% of total LNG imports into the, into the region. The volume of spot LNG cargoes has risen almost three times in five years, from 63 BCM in 2016 to 171 BCM in 2022. Next slide, please. Just very quickly, click the next one. In terms of the three different categories of consumption, uh, the, the figures, below, figures show the changes over the 15 surveys. For gas and gas competition, you see the rise in pipe imports uh, from 2005 to 2016, then sort of flattening off. That's the European effect. 
in domestic production, the blue line, obviously the US and North America play a huge role in the amount of GOG in domestic production. And so in LNG imports, uh, we see sort of flattish uh, through 2016 and the rise we've talked about. The, dec- the changes in OPE are sort of a mirror image, really, of what's been going on in the gas on gas competition category. So we see the, the, the gradual decline since 2016 in oil indexation. The next slide, please. Turning to price levels, um, obviously, kind of everybody knows this, 2022 saw record gas prices. With Europe's average wholesale price reaching over $30 a million BTU, which dragged the world average up to, up to just under $9.50, its highest price ever, compared with the record low, the COVID low of $3.20 per million BTU in 2020. The highest price ever were also recorded in all of the regions apart from North America and the former Soviet Union. Globally, wholesale prices have generally risen between 2005 and 2014, apart from North America, where the shale gas revolution led to a reduction in prices. Those regions with lots of regulated pricing, Africa, Middle East and the former Soviet Union, generally experienced rising prices through 2015 before levelling off, driven by the move away from more subsidised pricing in many countries. Since 2015, prices in Asia, Asia Pacific and Europe have broadly tracked each other, this link was broken in 2019 as spot prices dropped significantly in a well-supplied market, which benefited the heavily spot-priced European market more than Asia and Asia-Pacific. These differences widened further in 2020 as spot prices collapsed in the pandemic. However, 2021, with a rapid post-pandemic demand recovery and, and growth driving a surge in hub prices, European prices leapt above Asia and Asia-Pacific, and obviously, um, that was accelerated by the Russian uh, war in Ukraine in 2022. Next slide, please. This is the slide everybody, uh, nobody wants to finish top of. It's the wholesale price level uh, by country. This is all countries with consumption more than 8, 8 BCM in 2022. So the highest wholesale prices, as in 2021, uh, were found in Europe and not the main energy importing markets in Asia Pacific which traditionally used to be top this uh, uh, chart. The 10 highest prices were in Europe, especially in Central Eastern Europe, plus Ukraine because of their spot imports from Europe, are all well above $20 a million BTU. The main LNG importing markets in Asia and Asia Pacific are now further down the list. Um, prices remain relatively lower in the US, comparable to some Africa and Middle East countries. And prices in Russia have continued to be well below other countries which a few years previously they had been above, that's largely a consequence of the large uh, ruble depreciations. So next slide, please. Uh, now a few maps. This map sh- below, this map shows the main price formation mechanism by market. All we've done here is to take each market and say which, which price formation mechanism has the highest share. Um, so, Obviously, uh, we've talked about oil escalation and gas and gas competition. The regulated covers the three main regulated uh, categories. As we see, Europe is now almost all uh, gas on gas competition, with even Spain now having more of that category than oil indexation. Turkey is still categorized as oil indexation, um, but now with the change in the, in the pricing in the Gazprom contracts, it only just exceeds gas on gas competition. 82% of Europe is now GOG almost all domestic production, 82% of pipe imports, and 76% of LNG imports in 2022 were gas on gas competition. If you go back to the first survey in 2005, only the UK and Europe had any significant levels of GOG. As we see, oil indexation is still the largest category in most Asian countries, even those such as Malaysia, Vietnam, and the Philippines, where it is mostly domestic production. Obviously, there's a large area of the world, the more green one, covering the former Soviet Union, Middle East and, and North Africa, the prices remain largely regulated. Next slide, please. So another couple of maps here, we have what we call the wholesale prices heat map, which illustrates where the high and low price markets were in 2022. The highest ones in deepest red uh, were those where prices were over $20 a million BTU, you know, going down orange, 15 to 20, 
going down to the deep green, where it's below five dollars a million BTU. As we see, Europe was dominated uh, by the high price markets in 2022, with South Korea and China, Chinese Taipei also averaging over twenty dollars a million BTU on the back of the increase in spot energy imports. Countries like Japan, Turkey, and Spain also heavily import dependent have prices less than twenty dollars because of the mixture of oil indexation and spot prices. Markets with prices below $10 are largely those with almost all their consumption met by domestic production, including the trading market of the US. Prices below $5 are dominated by the regulated markets, often subsidised, concentrating the former Soviet Union, Middle East and Africa. 2022 also saw significant falls in gas demand in some markets, notably in Europe, where the very high prices curtail demand in industrial sectors, especially led to behavioural changes in households. Outside these markets, prices don't appear to impact in gas demand that much, with the weakness in Chinese gas demand more reflection of the continuing impact of the COVID lockdowns. Generally, very generally, the markets with very high prices saw significant declines in demand, and those with lower prices, small declines or even increases. Next slide, please. So just to sum up the key points, um, at the global level, the gas on gas competition share is uh, over 50%, the partner import share at 63% and energy imports at 47%, getting very close to half the LNG market. The share of spot LNG has risen again to 35%, the big shift away in 2022 from Asia, particularly China towards Europe. Uh, the rising share of gas on gas competition, which in the early days of 2016 was largely uh, in the part on imports uh, uh, category, uh, mainly in Europe. Since then, with the rising US LNG exports, it's been largely in LNG imports. Wholesale prices reached their highest level in 2022, compared with their lowest ever levels in 2020 as spot prices soared. Finally, as we, as we obviously are aware, European prices were by far the highest associated with significant falls in gas demand. So we did see some price elasticity in the markets. And with that, uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mike. That was a very brief summary of a very deep report. And uh, before, I think I'd like to ask everybody now to come back on uh, screen, all of our experts. And I would like to open the floor with, uh, with the first discussion question uh, that uh, I hope everybody can uh, take a turn answering. Uh, so this year's report showed that 2022 was a milestone year, as, as Mike explained to us, uh, for the gas markets, uh, with a share of gas on gas, competitively priced uh, gas in, in the market consumption, totally, in total market consumption, sorry, uh, reaching over half uh, of all gas consumed. So I guess for broader audience out there, what is the significance of that for for the gas market for the for the product uh, itself, and why why do we uh, why do we think it might be important? Uh, so what what does everybody else what, what does everybody think? Maybe Mike will take the first turn, and, uh, and then everybody uh, can jump in uh, to comment. You're on mute, Mike. Somebody must have muted me. I, I didn't touch, touch anything, honest. Um, yeah, I think the the rise over fifty percent is sort of a uh, sort of a benchmark. Really, it's uh, it's not really that much significant rise in one percent uh, in another year. Um, but I think it's um, I think pr probably more interesting is that is the rise in the LNG share to forty seven percent. That's getting close to fifty percent now, uh, and that could be one to look out for in the future. Um, so I think it's in terms of looking forward, then it, it, the global level, it may sort of go around about 50 percent, could drop a little bit low with, with small changes. Um, but we're certainly looking at a world where you know, half the world's pricing is now what we call you know, trading gas on gas competition or competitive pricing. I think the LNG market is becoming a little bit more interesting in terms of what might happen there.
Thanks very much. Uh, anybody else would like to comment on what that means for the markets? Gas as a commodity also is not something that we've always had, of course, now that we are talking about the gas markets uh, and the global gas markets today hasn't always been the case and not that long ago, actually, if we think about it, it wasn't. So perhaps uh, Vera. Sure, and uh, you, thanks for, very much for the opportunity to join uh, this morning for the release of this uh, report. And you won't be surprised that that, that I want to give perhaps sort of a, a traded gas and particularly LNG perspective on this. But um, as gas continues to move away from oil indexation, it, it really means that the gas market needs to now further develop its own instruments and tools for the mitigation of price risk, right? And for a long time, oil has provided the sort of deep and liquid market and, and served a good purpose. And, and now gas needs to, to look another way, look at the mature pricing markets such as in North America and work with the sort of skills and experiences in those markets to help develop necessary tools. And, um, you know, for LNG benchmarking specifically, actually, we've seen some really notable developments. Um, fixed price transactions now only really appear in South Asia LNG near-term imports. And LNG benchmarks are now sort of the index for nearly all short-term LNG trade in Asia and in other locations. And while in last year we've seen sort of a decline in counterparties in LNG markets and the market sort of temporarily stored in terms of its commoditization, now this year in 2023, we have seen the return of market participants. And, and we see this, for example, reflected in the PLATS assessment process uh, in Asia, where we've seen now actually record levels of activity in terms of volumes of LNG traded, whether that's physical or financial. And if just to give a brief example, in for the JKM uh, in the third quarter, we've seen volumes uh, for physical and derivatives trade reaching a record 2.1 million metric tons equivalent. That's about 33 LNG cargoes. And this makes that quarter the most active on record for the APEC uh, market on close assessment process in, in those markets. So LNG uh, market pricing adoption continues, um, you know, sort of a pace in this sort of environment. Um, uh, with you know, we've seen linkages uh, to the JKM in China city gas contracts and US LNG feed gas contracts in the Indian domestic market. And why I say that is because the more these sort of um, price references get written into contracts, the more intuitive also the next step in finding risk management tools will be. So I think this has been this development has been quite a significant shift in helping the commoditization of the traded gas and LNG markets. Thank you very much, Jared. That's a great, uh, great, important point to make. And uh, anybody else that that would like um, to go next? Yes, great. so maybe yes. Thank you. So maybe first of all, a word of appreciation uh, for 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 this report. Um, you know, we say at the International Energy Agency that we make our hands dirty with data, um, and this is you know a reference to uh, primary research to fundamental research and and i think that um the wholesale gas price uh, survey is is one of the great example of of such work it is it is really a book of reference uh, it is, it is a you know one of the studies i always uh, suggest uh, to my to my students um, because it is just the best of information in there um, in respect of uh, of the of the changes we are seeing, um, I think that the fact that um, the share of gas on gas uh, competition increased uh, to around fifty uh, percent in global gas consumption is a very welcome development uh, because it means that uh, the price signal um, is going to uh, to to unleash a greater flexibility of the gas system because it is sending the right signals both to the supply side and uh, to the demand side. And uh, when we are looking back uh, to 2022, when uh, the global gas system and in particular the European market suffered an unprecedented uh, supply shock, it has been really clear um, that it is important 
to have the price signals right. This was uh, the factor which enabled Europe to attract a record level of LNG, but it was also the price signal which, um, which was driving down demand in the most price sensitive uh, demand segments. So in a way, the right price signals uh, were key to avoid uh, physical gas supply shortages in the European market. So there is a, I think, a close link uh, between, between um, open markets, which are providing uh, the right price signal, and security of supply, which is, of course, uh, at the heart of our work at the International Energy Agency. So I, I think in this respect, it, it, is, it is a very significant development, uh, as well as Mike pointed out, we see that now almost half of the global LNG is traded um, in a way linked uh, to, to gas on gas uh, basis. Uh, and this also enables a more liquid, more flexible LNG market. Um, and we have seen this um, in, at play in 2022. Uh, when global flows have been reshuffling and uh, they were flowing where they have been needed the most, namely uh, the European gas market. Thank you very much, Maybe Tom. I in, yeah, I was coming in and I'll echo. I mean, there's not a great deal more to say. It's all, not already be said, but I do definitely want to echo uh, points that Greg made that and, and 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 that was made by uh, Madam President right at the beginning. You know, this is this is truly a u unique report. You know, we we look at many reports in terms of what's happening in the market. I, I don't know another report like this one that comes out annually that has the history that that gives you that view in terms of what's going on in, in terms of price development as opposed to outright price. And it it really is a really useful um, uh, piece of body of work uh, that informs so much and and. The, in terms of that 50% 50, 50 threshold point, um, it is significant. I mean, yeah, it's, it, it's a percentage point or so greater than the year before. So it's not like it's a big jump through, a, um, um, through the halfway mark, but it does show that market development. And, you know, Mike highlighted that, that in the last year, in that, in that period, we've seen moves to uh, gas on gas pricing in Turkey, in, in, in Tunisia, which I think is really interesting. You know, that movement to, I assume, uh, certainly in the Tunisian case, capture something that's referenced to, to TTF or ICIS TTF or, or, or probably PSV, if it's in the case of Tunisia, moving European prices, spreading that, that domino effect using um, supply and demand signals, uh, which are captured in the traded market, uh, to, to bleed into other, other regions and, and move away from uh, regulated or or, or uh, pricing or oil indexation, so it, it it is a step. It's a significant step, uh, and and I and I dare say there'll be more growth in gas on gas, as as Mike said, probably mainly in the LNG sector, but also in in, in the pipeline market as 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 these the churn grows uh, as we go forward. Thanks very much, Tom, and thank you all for kind words about the report. Uh, it's, it's always good to hear uh, that it's useful and it continues to, to be uh, valued, which is why we continue to do it. So I'd like to just to touch a bit uh, on, on what uh, was brought up and, and expand on the point uh, of the price shocks that uh, obviously were, were record breaking last year and uh, created some damage also around the world. So we, we did see movement of, uh, of molecules to where they needed more, most or, or another way to, to maybe look at it or who could afford them uh, because some, some uh, demand destruction was also happening in the developing world, which in some of the new markets which were unfortunately priced out essentially so you know it'd be really good i think in this forum to comment a bit on the interconnection what's what's the interplay between uh, global markets and liquid markets and the price signals and and the price shocks uh, in general so there are different perceptions of that i think out there it'd be good to to comment in terms of the um, of the interplay and I guess the fundamentals as well that, that are playing into that uh, in terms of available supply and, uh, and, and demand. Anybody want to jump in? 
Uh, I just make a quick quick comment, Tatiana. I think that, that, that there was a question in the Q and A. I guess we'll we'll come to that, but um, on, a, on a different point. Uh, yeah, I think as we said, the the big switch was uh, you know a lot of spot LNG cargoes just disappeared from the Asian market, especially from China. Although that helped their, their demand was was sort of flat uh, and fled towards Europe. I mean, it was a, almost unprecedented movement of of molecules around the world. To, to replace the, the rapid decline in Russian pipe imports. Um, I think, as, as uh, the Madam President said, some of the uh, developing countries, uh, poor countries, got swept up in, the, uh, in this, this movement of cargoes away from Asia, from Asia Pacific towards Europe, especially Pakistan. Uh, we saw from the map there, their demand was down a lot, and that's because they couldn't get LNG. Um, and this it, it, we like to say the market has worked. Well, it did work, but it has. Uh, there are some victims along the way of the market working, and we should be, I think, cognizant of, of that fact. Uh, the market work; it doesn't always work in a in a in a fair manner. Any other thoughts? I guess I guess I would just say that in general, when you've got a short uh, supply or you've got a tight supply, that's that's really what the, the signals are providing for. They're moving it to to the highest bidder essentially. So uh, what, until until things balance on the supply side, probably going to continue to see some of this uh, some of this challenging uh, trade off. Maybe, maybe I'll just just a quick thought. You know, thinking about the trajectory, uh, and I and I will come to talking about additional volumes to the market soon, but, you know, I, I guess to the point that Mike said, you know, we're, we're talking about this, uh, you know, from a very pro-traded market perspective, but of course the effects of the traded globalized market, LNG moving around the world, in some instances are, are, are going to be a barrier to countries wanting to liberalize and open up their markets because they've seen if they are exposed to the market in such a way that that, 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 that can have a detrimental impact upon them upon their security of supply, energy supply, their energy poverty. So we need to be cognizant of that as well, you know, thinking that the, 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 the gas on gas uh, in a globalised world is, is, is the only way or the best way. I mean, it does. It, uh, there, there are winners and losers, right? And we, we need to be aware of that and acknowledge that. Vera? I mean, what I would add to that is that um, I, I fully agree of, of course, with the impact on the global market and different participants. And at the same time, when we say the markets worked, I think it's not only about work in the respect that the marginal unit got pulled into the center of highest demand, but the market has also worked in the sense that on the back of the price spikes that we've seen, we've seen um, investment in LNG infrastructure at a scale and pace that we've never seen before. And that means that as we go into this winter, um, you know, I'm not saying we're out of the woods, but the market is in a more robust state. If you hadn't allowed the market to send those signals, we, we wouldn't have seen this reaction. So there is, you know, there is different perspectives to this. And that's not about distracting from the fallout in the consumption areas. But it's also really important to see that the investment where it's needed has actually been made. And um, that's a pretty significant development. Thank you. That's a great point indeed. We've seen some uh, the other records uh, were in infrastructure approvals and, and building last year that we've seen and certainly uh, very important. So let me just go to uh, the first question in the Q&A at this point. Uh, and, uh, it out. Uh, I think that everybody can also comment on this, but probably Mike will be the first. Um, much of the large new volumes of LNG are due to come from Qatar in the, the mid 2020s. Do you see that this new supply being oil indexed, and uh, and do you, in that case, will the share of oil indexation in LNG deliveries continue to move, start to move the other way, and, and grow higher? Yeah. Um... Yeah, I think um, obviously not privy to the contracts Qatar is signing, but uh, in all likelihood, as volumes from Qatar going to the Asian Asian markets going east, basically will be oil indexed. But Qatar has been sort of quite flexible when it's been sending cargoes to Europe. 
I mean, any any cargoes coming to Europe are going to be hub priced. Nobody's going to sign an all index contract bringing uh, LNG in, into Europe. So, the extent volumes come there, then it's it's going to be a bit of a mixture. But having said that, I mean, if we're looking at the the export projects coming on in by 2030, there's enormous amount of new project new capacities being built. Half of that's coming from the US. So or more likelihood it's going to be some sort of Henry hub or, or, or maybe even sort of TTF linked if it's going into Europe. So it, it's probably the other way around in a sense when we were looking at this in by the end of the 2020s, uh, the survey is still, still carrying on then. And you'd imagine on, on those parameters of more than half of the uh, capacity, new capacity coming from the US, that gas on gas competition will be even higher share. So, it, so a lot of the growth is coming from those markets, which are more more hub linked uh, than oil indexation. So I think yes, the answer is right for Qatar. The question, question is said, but in, in the global scheme of things, the US is going to dominate the increase in capacity. Thank you so much. Any other thoughts? I guess Mike covered the basis pretty well on that. <laughs> it's, it's hard to follow his lead. Uh, I, I think maybe a follow-up question on that, uh, and, and this is going more to the, towards the fundamentals of the reports and sort of the different price mechanisms. Why do you think uh, there's still continuing sort of prevalence in some areas to continue to use oil price? Uh, index uh, pricing, uh, whereas uh, Vera's uh, voiced a very clear opinion that it's better to, to have uh, gas only mechanisms. Uh, but uh, are there advantages to the oil price uh, indexation continuing and to be to be used? And uh, what do we think about this is the interplay between the two? I mean, from a from a gas producer who who is perspe the perspective of a producer who who likes to use oil indexation, be you you know obviously we just mentioned Qatar there. Um, Russia certainly likes to sell its its gas on an oil index basis basis, but it's you know with the contracts it has with China pipeline contracts with China and wants to continue to sign those. You know the, the argument from from both those producer nations is that it, it gives the certainty to the buyer and the seller in terms of what the price will be. You know multiple months in advance effectively and therefore can really help manage uh i guess the cash flow situation from 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 both sides um and so for markets that do not want to or, or, or governments that don't want to be exposed to uh fluctuations in price uh or, or want to have have more um regimented economies that, that where they want to understand what's going on uh, and, and be able to plan in advance, then, then that is going to uh, facilitate the, the continued use of, of, of oil indexation. Um, and there, there are many reasons why, why certain governments or countries want to use that in terms of, you know, they're a developing nation or, or, or it's a combined economy of some description. So, but, but those are the reasons. Thank you, Vera. Yeah, and I would add to that, um, that, I mean, in, in nascent markets, right, and, and gas and LNG markets are still developing, you sometimes find yourself in a bit of a chicken and egg question as well, right? Because people may say we want, we want to have more gas to gas pricing, more LNG pricing. But when they say that, they also say we want to do that in a liquid market environment where I know I have deep liquid markets with um, deep forward curves, and I have that comfort that I can uh, you know, manage my risk uh, year, years ahead. So you have oil as a proven fallback to that. Uh, and so it's only natural that people sort of want to stay in their comfort zone. Uh, and so I think you, you probably need to look at this as a, as a development that needs to happen in parallel and is happening in parallel, right? Gas markets are evolving. We see gas to gas pricing evolving. You know, we had a really interesting discussion with the industry just a few weeks ago where people said, OK, you know, we've got we've got the hubs, but we also, you know, we've got not only the JKM, but I think proven over the last year or so that there is a space for bespoke LNG 
pricing in Europe and how do we that make that happen? And um, you know, we we see um adoption of tighter specifications for LNG trading into Europe. So the market is is becoming more sophisticated in that sense. And so I think there is going to be sort of a natural progression from here. We've got a good platform now. And, and sometimes you can also see that a massive disruption that we've had can perhaps lead people to stall for a moment and take a pause and, you know, want to be careful to not ride on that precarious wave. But as we're coming out of this, um, I, I think the path is very clear that gas to price, gas pricing with hubs, with LNG specific pricing will develop further from here. But um, something needs to happen at the same time that, you know, only once these markets are sort of deeper and more liquid, uh, the market will also become comfortable to contemplate more switching in that area. Thank you very much. Important point. And as, as you'll know from the survey in 2016, two uh, thirds of all gas was priced on, on oil index and non uh, non non gas on gas. So the gas on gas share more than or it just doubled, almost doubled since, since then. So it's definitely moving quickly in that direction, Mike. Yes, Mike. Uh, uh, just a quick comment on that. I mean, oil indexation uh, does occasionally sort of uh, come back again. In years. It's just domestic pricing. Uh, mechanism to oil indexation away from uh, sort of basket of hub pricing, just as oil index prices are going above spot prices. So maybe they'll change back again. So that's a little bit um, you know, going against the trend. But also with the rising pipe imports into China from Russia uh, and possibly further expansion there, they are generally oil indexed as well. So there's always little spots of oil indexation coming back. I think it'll be less so in the LNG market. But sometimes in domestic production like India and pipe imports, you, you, you see them coming back a little bit. Thanks so much. Uh, and we've got another question from the uh, Q&A. How much of the European gas demand destruction would you consider to be permanent now? Crystal balls out. <laughs> I'd be very grateful. Also, I'd be very interested to hear and answer those questions, but I'm not sure anybody has it. Okay, well, um, you know, we have been looking at, at this issue um, in 2022, I think uh, industrial gas uh, consumption declined in Europe by roughly uh, 20%. And what we have seen, you know, in the first half of 2023 is that this demand reduction has been continuing despite the easing of the of the of the prices and and this is you know alluding maybe to to some rigidities operational but also managerial rigidities um what we see when we are looking at the most recent data points for a july for august is that in some markets um there is some recovery happening in industrial gas demand including spain where uh, gas consumption increased by uh, in the industry increased by over 25 percent year on year so we, we see some recovery but um i think it is it is also very clear that um that we are not going to to recover up to the 2021 to the pre-crisis levels um in europe a number of um, of industries uh, have seen their basically their business uh, plan uh, broken in a way. Um, and we also see these different surveys carried out in, 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 in Europe, which shows that, for instance, in Germany, 32% of the, of, the, of the companies are considering um, to either uh, reduce uh, their production rates or um, to, to leave in, in other markets where uh, gas prices and energy prices are more favorable. Now, I think this uh, casts a long shadow uh, on industrial uh, gas demand in Europe. Uh, we, we will provide a bit more analysis on this topic in our upcoming medium-term gas report, which will be published in the beginning of, of, of October. So I would not display any um, figures before that, um, but, but I think that, that the main message here is that, um, that because we have seen um, an easing of, of the prices, this does not necessarily translate into, into, into a recovery in industrial gas demand. So I think that, you know, 
there have been uh, some uh, structural demand reduction in that space. I just think it's also important to remind everyone that when we talk about recovery, I mean, particularly if you're thinking about year on year, I mean, I personally, when I look at year on year growth, growth or, or negative growth, um, you know, yes, in, I agree with Greg that industrial gas demand in some countries um, is up year on year now in August and July, but the base year of 22, 2022 is it, it, you know, the demand was so low. That was exactly when the, the price, the, the, the real price shock kicked in. So rising from an extremely low base, I, personally, I don't constitute as a recovery. Uh, and when we still, if you compare against 2022 or 2023 versus say a five-year average pre-COVID, then, then, then the, the volumes uh, consumed by industry are um, remain very, very low. Um, and we certainly at ICIS kind of expect them to, to remain low, particularly in the, in, in the petrochemical and fertilizer industry. Um, it's not purely a function of, of the high price, which is, as, as Greg alluded to, you know, making operational and managerial decisions uh, hard, you know, high, high price today, and, and that forward curve being even higher into this winter and the winter after, but but also a function of um, the expansion of, of, of petrochemical and fertilizer uh, production capability around the world, which happened five years ago. There was a wave pre-COVID where, where, where new equipment and new factories and, and plants were built uh, in lower cost environments, in, in a, principally in China, but also elsewhere in America and, else, and elsewhere, um, which are now underutilized but more efficient and therefore if you're a, a global petrochemical producer and you've got an underutilization of, of of your global fleet and you've got extremely high prices in europe and and that's where you're some of your older plants are it's it's natural that's where it's good they're going to close if they have to close something so yeah ultimately from a gas perspective there is i i would expect uh we're not we're not going to return to that pre-covid norm Thank you very much, Tom and Greg, uh, and we're very much looking forward to the uh, to the gas outlook as it's also a very, very useful, extremely useful, very great report. So thanks for continuing to do that, Greg. Um, so I think the other thing naturally also, it's, as we're talking about the future a little bit on the demand side, uh, are, what's the outlook for, for the upcoming heating season in the Northern uh, Hemisphere? Do you think we're, in terms of the crisis, where are we? Is there still risk of, uh, of uh, volatility and price shocks? Uh, or, is, or is that something that, that should still be on the radar? We've got six minutes to, to address that. So uh, who wants to go next? Um, yeah, so maybe um, I can start with... Um... You know, at the moment, um, EU storage sites are uh, about ninety-five percent full, um, and 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 this is a very comfortable level. We have uh, twelve BCM more gas than the five-year average, um, but uh, full storage sites are not not a guarantee against winter volatility and the risk of uh, of of supply issues. Um, and when we are looking at um, you know the, the upcoming winter season, we see a number of uh, exogenous uh, risk factors, including the cold winter, which alone could increase uh, uh, gas demand in the European residential and commercial sectors by around 30 BCM. But there is obviously, um, you know, considering the geopolitical uh, context, there is a risk that uh, Russian pipe gas flows can further decline. And there are question marks uh, regarding the availability of LNG, partly because you know, potential uh, supply disruptions due to unplanned outages, uh, strikes, or uh, because of a more robust uh, demand uh, in, in, in uh, Northeast Asia, including in China, where there have been a growing share of temperature sensitive demand. Um, so the best way in our view to risk, uh, to hedge against uh, these risks is to continue uh, structural demand reductions, um, including via a um, more robust deployment of uh, renewables, uh, better energy efficiency standards, and also consuming uh, natural gas in a responsible manner, 
to, to be a good citizen also in, in this respect. So there is obviously, you know, risks uh, for uh, price volatility. And this has been, I think, displayed also in August when the market has been um, very nervously reacting to the news coming from Australia, uh, but also to the different uh, maintenance and extended maintenance, uh, which is happening in Norway. Actually, when we are looking at uh, the volatility for August, the price volatility on TTF, it has been the highest uh, since uh, Russia's uh, brutal invasion uh, started against Ukraine. So this you know, shows how sensitive uh, the market is. This being said, the absolute uh, price variability is, of course, significantly lower than it has been uh, last year. Thank you very much. Anybody else, Tom? Yeah, I just just on rather I focus on the volatility. I mean, ultimately, until the global gas market is 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 not as tight as it is, which realistically won't happen until 2026, 2027, and and that new Qatari volume as well as the additional US uh, exports, it's going to be a tight market, and that ultimately will lead when Europe is so dependent on spot LNG will lead to volatility, and that is something that war or no war, uh, Europe and, and the rest of the world needs to, needs to uh, accept and, and, and um, that, that, that will be, yeah, uh, it will be the norm for, for two or three years still. Mike. Yeah, just very quickly, I would say absent a supply disruption, which is always a possibility given where we are, and Tom Wright said it's a very tight market, Given the amount of gas in European storage now, then even with a cold winter, um, yeah, the, the market may have higher prices, but should be able to balance without any disruption. Um, but a cold winter would kind of kick the can down the street if that emptied European storage into the summer when, when Europe's then got to bid heavily against the other markets to, to refill its storage. If it's a mild winter, I think then we're, it's almost, almost a repeat of last winter given the amount of gas in European storage. And also with LNG supply now, absent the strikes in Australia, uh, rising uh, you know, reasonably significantly, not as big as the rise is going to be in 25, 26, 27. LNG, more LNG supply is coming on. So it's a little bit fingers crossed for this coming winter. Excellent. Thank you very much. Not, not much to add. I think, um, <laughs> you know, my three fellow panelists, yeah, I think have, have covered all, all the ground. I think, I mean, only maybe to wrap this up to, to, I think, where we've landed on this is that I think it's fair to say that Europe's market setup is much more resilient uh, than what it was last winter. Uh, but if there is any risk, it's only to the upside. And, and that probably not only for this year, but but the following year, you know, given the uh, the infrastructure and also the supply situation. So uh, I think we're looking at this from a position of more comfort, um, but it also means psychologically for the market to accept that this is a very different situation. And what we see at the moment is that any price spike, even if it may be much more within limits to compare what we've seen last summer, is just creating kind of that, that, that collective panic as everybody's trying to figure out what, what happens next. Now, this with experience may sort of calm a little bit, but I think at the moment it seems quite a natural reaction to the market to react quite strongly to any potential disruption signals that we're getting. Thank you very much. That's an excellent uh, wrap up, I think, for the conversation. I'd like to thank our panelists here today, our experts. Thank you so much for, for joining us. This is an excellent discussion. Uh, I'd like to thank our audience and, and the journalists who were here uh, submitting their questions and the audience on stream. Thanks all for watching. If anybody has any follow-up questions or you'd like more information on anything that we spoke about today, uh, any related topics, please don't hesitate to, uh, to get in touch. Uh, you can send me an email and I'll be happy to, to facilitate further. Without further ado, thanks so much again and uh, enjoy the rest of your day.